From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Schaap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Today, we're going to discuss how to be good neighbors when it comes to sharing a fence with your sales team. Joining us is Ryan Rood, who is the founder and CEO at Lake One, which is an agency that works with startups, social enterprises, and growth-driven brands to plan, strategize, and execute digital marketing programs. Lake One helps their clients across a diverse set of industries, from technology to manufacturing and professional services, and they help them find traction, drive demand, and grow revenue. And today, Ryan is going to talk us through the value and incremental ROI of sales and marketing alignment. Okay, here's our conversation with Ryan Rood, founder and CEO at Lake One. Ryan, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Thanks, Ben. Happy to be here. Very excited to have you on the show. Excited to talk a little bit about how we can be neighbors. We're recording this at the beginning of the year. Let's start off on a good fit. Sales and marketing sit next to each other. Sometimes we argue about, you know, who's responsible for what. What's the right way to build a good relationship between sales and marketing teams? And why does it actually have a business impact? It's the age old battle, right? I mean, anybody that sat in marketing seat or anybody that sat in sales seat, always at some point in their career, they've pointed the finger at somebody else and blamed them for failure to hit some goal. It's the rare few that have sat in both seats and realized the pain of having the accountability to the same goal, which is growing the business. So over the course of building and growing Lake One, we just inevitably saw the fact that these two teams really should be one. They should both have responsibility for revenue. And at the same time, people started talking about sales and marketing alignments, marketing, and we started having those conversations with our clients as well. I'm going to go a little obscure here and talk about an old movie, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, where (laughs) the sales team is always complaining about the quality of the leads and the marketing team is saying, you know, you should convert the leads before we give you the good ones. So you mentioned that these should be one team. And in my mind, the reason why they are actually separate teams is how they are evaluated and compensated. The sales team's job is to hunt and kill and they, you know, are paid on commission. And the marketing team, you know, is supposed to get leads and we're salaried and we get the cush job, but we get fired first. That's generally how it works. Talk to me about the collaboration between the two teams and how is that changing? Why are they less distant than they used to be? And here's what's so interesting. So you throw a rock, you can find a data bit for anything. But what I found working with our clients is that it seems like a lot of times marketers, anybody that fills out a form, that's a lead and they send it over to sales. And like somewhere in the neighborhood of like two thirds to 70% of those leads get sent to sales. And that's where the crap lead quality comes in. You're lucky if you're going to get like a third of those to actually be qualified. When you start thinking about what is the actual bottom line metric that everybody put all of the, you know, how you're compensated, all of that aside, and you really just focus on what are we all here to achieve, which is growing the business. What is the top line thing that we want to measure, which is revenue growth and get everybody aligned around that and work backwards from that. Look at what is the agreement on the trailing indicator for the business. Start speaking CEO and CFO language and work backwards from that that's when you can actually start to say, okay, these are the things marketing can influence and these are the things sales can influence on the way to the revenue number. I think one of the things that's changed with the rise of the sort of digital era is that we have more end-to-end tracking and accountability, Mm -hmm. right? There are integrated systems that can say, here's the ad that was served to this person. Here's what the conversion rate is from that ad. We get a quality score and then we understand the sale through rate. Right. And now that everything is essentially digitized or we have really advanced CRMs, 
in theory, you can connect the dots from here's the value of an ad, here's the value of an email, here's how likely sales is going to close, and here's the value of this potential customer's in reality, that doesn't always work. So talk to me about the end-to-end -end data that we are, in theory, able to collect. And where does it break down? I appreciate that you put the in theory because a lot of people just bucket us as a digital marketing agency because it's easy for them to wrap their head around that concept. But really, we're a growth consultant focused on aligning the sales and marketing effort. Yes, pipeline is a result. But the key piece of what we do is making sure that there's a right-sized tech stack. So the in theory piece comes down to making sure that you choose the right pieces of technology that are aligned with your strategy. The technology and the tool is not the strategy. The strategy is supported by the technology and the tool. So in theory, getting to all of those data points that you need has to start with having an aligned strategy. We'll walk into a lot of clients get that are frustrated because they've been sold a basket of goods on marketing automation. That they just turn it on and all these leads and all these new sales opportunities are coming along or CRM is going to be the magical tool that's going to help sales sell so much more efficiently. And at the end of the day, what you realize is that nobody actually sat down to say, what are we actually measuring? What is the metrics? What are the leading indicators that point to those trailing indicators for revenue that we want to look at that lead back to this conversion on this ad or this conversion on this content campaign or this account-based marketing effort? Nobody just asked those questions and put those things in place in the technology stack. And unfortunately, either the marketer gets blamed, the salesperson gets blamed, or the technology gets blamed. I saw a stat recently that came out and we just posted it on our LinkedIn page that somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of a marketer's tech stack gets ripped and replaced every year because of that exact problem. They can't figure out how to connect those dots, but nobody's asking the right questions. What are we actually trying to measure when connecting those dots? Yeah, I feel that pain. I'm about to rip my CRM out, throw it in the garbage. <laughs> and that actually has to do more with the bug where it's not connecting my BCC emails. So I have no idea how to follow up with people because I can't keep track of all those emails. Now this is turning into a bitch fest, not a podcast. Oh, so no. <laughs> let's get back into talking about the sales and marketing enablement. You know, we talked about why the alignment drives ROI. Talk to me about the business case for the end to end connection of data and why is it something worth investing money, time, effort, and resources into figuring out? At the very basic level of it, having alignment between sales and marketing, it just drives a better customer experience. From the very top of the funnel all the way down through the sales experience, your prospects and your customers are feeling the same messages, communications, pricing. It's all very fluid. So better customer experience, better results better internal team collaboration. There's a lot of turnover. We know in sales at the high level of marketing leadership, we know there's a lot of turnover. All of that is driven by the pressures of hitting goals and metrics. Having these two teams aligned and really marching towards what the CFO, what the CEO, what the board is looking at and actually hitting those numbers takes that pressure off. So improving, especially in a market time where employment is really low and it's hard to hire high quality performers, those are all kind of soft, squishy things. And sometimes they lead with those because I think people forget the value of those things, things like customer experience and the things like, hey, if I've actually got a really good sales performer, or a really good marketing performer, and they're leaving because they're frustrated because of all of these other internal tensions, that's a problem, especially if you spent years rolling out a strategy, putting all of this technology in place, and you're starting to get some traction. Other things that I think is really interesting is when you start to get that alignment and you start to get the feedback loop and you start getting the teams talking together, that's when the iteration happens. That's when you really get to start to see things that are really cool. We had a client where we had quarterly marketing and sales alignment conversations, and we started to realize that our definitions of MQLs were off. And so often marketing, that's their golden measure, right? Like MQL volume, that's all that matters. And that's where we stop and it's handed off to sales. What we really worked with them on is it's not just the MQL. We really want to be held accountable to the marketing source revenue. How much revenue is marketing adding to the pipeline opportunity and how much of that pipeline is actually closing? Over time, what we started to see is that it's not necessarily the volume of the marketing qualified leads that mattered. It was the quality of those. We figured that out, reduced the volume and the size of the marketing source revenue added to the pipeline increased like 200% 
quarter over quarter. So if you really want to hold yourself accountable to kind of an arbitrary metric over here of MQLs, which you can finagle however you want, add some more qualification data to it or tweak your lead scoring, does that really impact revenue? I mean, at the end of the day, both of them matter, right? You need efficiency, right? You need high quality leads, but volume is something that's important. And I think that understanding the balance there and having that sort of baseline metric of, I don't know exactly what you would call it, but the algorithm is something to the extent of volume times quality equals output. And the things that you mentioned, why sales and marketing alignment really matters is first off, employee retention, keeping the team happy, making sure that everybody is in the same boat, rowing the same direction and not fighting against each other. There is a common goal here, which is driving revenue, but building that feedback loop. And that's really when you build the better customer experiences, then also having the ability to focus and drive efficiency as opposed to driving low quality volume. That's really what the tips are here. So tell me what people are doing to drive efficiency. Who's doing this well? What are some of the high level takeaways? If you're thinking about how do I improve my sales and marketing collaboration? How do I drive more leads more efficiently? What's the secret sauce? We have a process that we go through, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit, but it depends on the size of the organization. I mean, if you're just trying to figure this out, sometimes it's as simple as just getting the two teams to talk to each other. Everybody is meeting to death, right? Everybody has their little internal meetings. And I'm not advocating for adding more meetings to the calendar, but put marketing and sales together once a month, once a quarter to talk, talk about what they're doing, provide feedback. What I've always found fascinating is marketers either embrace accountability and love to cross over that fence, as you said in the intro, and help their sales folks, or they're scared to death of the accountability. And they like focusing on the things that they feel directly accountable to. So things like lead volume, marketing qualified leads, and then it stops there. And well, the rest of it's sales responsibility. So being held accountable to any sort of revenue metric and feeling like I can't really do anything much more to make the leads better quality. Ask, ask sales. Tell me about the last 10 sales conversations you've had from these sources what more information would have been helpful for you to get them more qualified, things like that. So that's the simplest thing that people can do is just have that conversation with their counterparts. You sort of hit the nail on the head here. Like what's the first thing you can do to be a better cross-functional partner is actually partner, actually talk to the people that you're working with, get the feedback, get the data. Also, people are sensitive of their time. You don't want to get caught being responsible for somebody else's work. I understand why there's a little tension there. So what's the right cadence when you're thinking about, you know, we need to have better communication with our sales team, but I don't want to get caught holding the bag if they're not holding up their responsibility. We're talking daily meetings, weekly meetings, monthly meetings. You know, what's the agenda? What does it look like? So we always say crawl, walk, run. And it could be even once a quarter, have a meeting, explain what the goal of the meeting is, getting everybody more tightly aligned. And I want to be clear, building a tightly aligned sales and marketing team, this isn't something that just happens overnight. We work with our clients on these efforts and it can take months, especially to refine both the sales and marketing process, get the technology in place. It's all iterative. But taking that first step, just having those conversations, doing it quarterly, I'd add to that piece for the real-time feedback element of it. If you do have a CRM or a marketing automation system in place, getting an agreement to say, hey, sales, can you let us know why you're rejecting some of these leads? We're going to create a property for reason for rejection and just let us know so that we can look and see, was it bad timing, bad fit? Let us know why, not enough information so that we can start thinking about, okay, do we need to be nurturing these longer? Is it the wrong industry? It was the deal size not large enough. There's a million different things that it could be, but when you start getting that information from sales, knowledge is power. So the first thing that I'm hearing is you got to get the anecdotal feedback high level. Set up your QBRs, have your hour meeting, follow it up with lunch, buy the guys a beer, whatever you know you're into. Build the relationship, but talk about over a longer period of time what are the things that worked and what are the things that didn't. Right, your quantitative feedback, not your qualitative feedback. And then the second part is on a regular basis. You're going to look at your qualitative feedback. You're talking about systems, about building the right processes, about looking at the data and understanding the reason behind some of the changes in status for your deals. 
And that's really more of your, you know, month to month type thing is let's get together and look at the deals that were rejected and talk about why, not let's talk about what systems we need to build. Yeah. So some of this starts to become a conversation that's bigger than just sales and marketing, because sometimes the longer term measurement requires business leadership also being in the room to break down backwards from those trailing indicators that I talked about. I always work from the revenue metric back to figure out, okay, what are the two teams responsible for and how are they supporting each other? So starting with the revenue number, working backwards through, you can insert whatever life cycle terms you want here, whether you believe in the funnel, the flywheel, whatever it is, it's constantly changing. But the point is working backwards from the end goal, which is usually revenue, looking at what's the customer win rate, What's the length of the sales cycle? What's the MQL to SQL conversion rate? What's that volume all the way back up to the top? So you can see we're working through the sales process and the marketing process. What I see a lot of times is that when you have that conversation as unified teams, sales has no idea what marketing is doing at the top of the funnel. And marketing has no idea how complicated the bottom of the funnel is. And a lot of times, marketing's not even aware of some of the movement it takes to get somebody from an MQL to a customer, all the statuses and the stages and the steps, and that there's places in there for marketing to help. So looking at it long-term, getting key metrics around that, I'm a huge fan of keeping it really simple, focused on you know three, four, five different data points. I'm a huge fan of the entrepreneurial operating system, the concept of a scorecard and keeping it really simple. I think people have a tendency to go into a dance of dashboards where it's like data on every possible thing. But when you're just looking for sales and marketing alignment, keeping it on the facts of what the two teams can influence and drive towards that bottom line goal, that's how you keep everybody accountable. I think understanding the entire funnel from introduction through lead generation and through the sales conversation, it's useful to understand the entire process to see where it's breaking down, which leads to the last question that I have for you today. When you're sitting down with your sales team and you're looking at, okay, here's how we drove our leads, how efficient were our marketing campaigns, okay? How did we figure out what the quality of them was? What was the conversion rate through sales? What was the revenue that was driven How do you benchmark what you're doing for success? How do you know if the problem is our initial demo call or if it's the process of getting somebody over the finish line where we're losing our customers? What are the benchmarks at each step of the way? Sometimes it's just looking at historical performance and measuring against once you've implemented an aligned effort. A lot of times for marketers that aren't salespeople, sitting and actually listening to those things the demo call, the close, all of those different things. I find getting a different perspective and looking at an outsider objective can help reset the benchmark, reset the expectation. It's difficult to be able to say, hey, is it a sales problem with the close or is it that the lead didn't know enough about our product, our competitors, our onboarding process? And in that case, those are marketing issues. Those are things that we didn't educate them enough before we handed them off to sales, which kind of gets into some of the pieces of putting a roadmap together and making sure how do we really qualify and hand over a sales ready lead. I understand what you're saying in the sense of it's useful for the marketing team to sit with sales and to understand that there's not going to be a 100% conversion rate. And that helps them understand what they can do better in terms of driving a higher quality score for a lead. Help me understand how you figure out what to do, right? Like, hey, should we be focused more on lead generation, on volume, on nurture, right? On just driving form fills. And then that goes into the sales is once somebody has filled out the form, is the demo call broken? Is the AE conversation not working? Is our pricing, our terms, you know, where does it break down? How do you figure out which part of the funnel you need to fix? So this is really where technology can come in really helpful, making sure that you're able to track these metrics all the way through the funnel and that you have agreement on what it actually means. Especially marketers are really good at making the numbers look really good for themselves. Salespeople are as well. That's the job, isn't it? That's the job, right. But we're all in this together. We're all trying to achieve the same output. I don't want to lean on saying, hey, you need this massive tech stack and this great reporting database or this great dashboard that shows you this awesome pipeline and funnel. And you can say, well, clearly everybody's getting stuck at the demo stage because we have a 5% conversion rate and look at all the opportunity ahead of it. 
it could just be a spreadsheet where you're tracking, like I said, from the top of the funnel all the way down, knowing that your revenue number on the outside is what you're really looking for. What we tend to do on an annual basis with our clients and sometimes back into on a semi-annual, so we check in twice, is what are your revenue goals? What's your average lifetime value for the customer and work backwards so that we know if you want to hit this, this is how many customers we need, which means we need to have this type of an SQL, the customer conversion rate, and we can work backwards through all of that. And if we're not hitting those numbers throughout that entire funnel, we already have it benchmarked and set. That's how you identify where the problem is. So if you have a 5% SQL to customer win rate and you have, I'm totally making numbers up right now because I don't have a calculator in front of me and a 10% MQL to SQL conversion rate and you've got worked all the way back through it, you have a spot in the dark to start looking. Otherwise, you're just going into the quarter and saying, well, we got this many leads and we got this much opportunity, but is it going to actually hit the quota that we set for the business for the quarter? Yeah, at the end of the day, people reached, people that are being nurtured, people that have a score that's high enough to be considered an MQL, getting them to be a sales accepted lead, and then understanding what their conversion rate, understanding what those conversion rates are at each step of the funnel is going to be different for each business. And honestly, that's where having experience and some agency or some outside resource to help you understand how to benchmark your business and where to focus can be really valuable. Yeah, and there's a lot of third-party data sources, too, that organizations can look to. But I always say, just download a calculator, even, and work yourself back. Most salespeople, most owners have a revenue target in mind. They know what they get on average from a new customer. Work backwards, and you'll at least have your own personalized benchmark. Okay, great advice. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Ryan Rood, founder and CEO of Lake One, for joining us. In part two of our interview, which we're going to publish tomorrow, Ryan is going to talk to us about how to build a sales and marketing alignment roadmap. If you can't wait until our next episode and you'd like to learn more from Ryan, you can click on the link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can contact him on Twitter. His handle is Lake1Co, L-A-K-E-O-N-E-C-O, or you can visit his company's website, which is lake1digital.com. Just one link in our show notes that I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D.com. For summaries of our episodes, contact information for our guests, you can sign up for our once a week newsletter. You can even send us your topic suggestions or your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is MartechPod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, basically everywhere. Or you can reach out to me directly. My handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, in addition to part two of our conversation with Ryan Rood, founder and, founder and CEO at Lake One, we're going to publish an episode every day. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Music.